Um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to everybody about animal mitigation. It's, uh, you know, not something that usually is at top of mind for most utilities, but we all deal with it. Um, and uh, we'll go through this presentation, some a little bit of outline here to start with. Um, number one, why even deal with this? Well, the, the reality is that animal-related outages are the number two cause of sustained power outages. That's from the American Public Power Association. And, and within that uh, category of animal-related outages, squirrels are number one and birds are number two. And that's pretty much true across North America and for that matter, around the world. Um, squirrels are everywhere, birds are everywhere, and they're unpredictable as all get out. Um, Critter Guard's been doing this for a long time. Um, we have a 20 year track record. We've got um, uh, repeat uh, businesses all across the world uh, that use the products we're gonna talk about today. Uh, and specifically what I'd wanna do is just introduce the concept of what we call proactive animal mitigation. And we'll talk about what that means. Uh, some, some brief discussion of how these products work and how they're unique uh, in terms of other things you might have seen or already used uh, in your animal mitigation efforts. Randy gave a bit of an introduction, just a little bit more. I'm actually the second owner of this business. Um, company got started in 2001. Um, I knew the original owners, but they were 95 when I bought the company. And we basically uh, brought in some more sophistication, did a lot of work with the supply chain, with um, basically uh, customer service, uh, quality manufacturing, where we did that, how we did that. Uh, my background's in chemical engineering. I've been around and involved with power and process industry for pretty much my entire career. So um, excited to be able to have this opportunity to speak to you guys today. So let's start with some definitions. These are very basic there where nobody's gonna get a PhD listening to this, but um, again, it's practical, uh, rational stuff that just when people get their brain around it, it's like, oh, now I get it. So we're gonna talk about the word proactive today, which is controlling a situation before it's occurred rather than just responding to that. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing I want people to take away from this is how can we think ahead because you know these kinds of issues are gonna happen. You just don't know where or when. Um, we're gonna use a, a, a definition of a barrier which is a blockade. It's not just a guard. We always talk about animal guards. Everybody's, you know, there's lots of competitors out there with animal guards. But we talk about a barrier or a blockade. Basically, we, we essentially stop the traffic pattern. And so basically then what is a guard uh, and how does that work? So there are lots of choices out there. Um, many of you probably use some, if not all, of the products that are shown here. Um, we refer to these as guards. Um, this is basically what happens in a substation or an overhead um, uh, cross arm, anything that's at risk. And generally, the, the utility we found just anecdotally by dealing with most of the utilities is, is that Essentially, they all know it's an issue, but they'll like, well, that's not really high on our list. We don't have a problem there. And then, of course, Murphy's Law pops up and says, you want to bet? <laughs> and the next thing you know, you've got an animal outage. All of these cages, covers, caps, crowns, whatever term you want to use, guards, are designed to go around and protect an energized device or an energized component. And as a result of that, there's a lot of engineering, a lot of um, insulation resistance, uh, many other electrical properties that need to be checked and confirmed. And obviously the size and the fit all has to be just right. 
So those are the questions you end up having to deal with. Which one do I need? Where do I need it? Is it even going to fit? Um, how do we install it? How do we maintain it? Um, and maybe some higher level questions. Is it even going to fix the problem? Or is it going to create another problem? Sometimes solving one issue just creates another problem downstream. One of those is, is just the overlap. Um, you saw on a previous slide over there in the lower right-hand corner, it was a fairly ubiquitous guard sold by multiple vendors um, that overlap. And you see them all the time in substations and they work perfectly well, except based on the placing and the, and the air gap between those um, bushings, you may have a possibility where a bird can create a nest behind it because they've overlapped and it makes a wonderful um, nesting place for a bird or a squirrel or something like that. So those are things that we've seen that happen quite often um, where customers then end up calling Critter Guard and go, what do you got? <laughs> so here's the way we think a little bit differently about these kinds of problems. And right at the top, we basically say we block the access rather than covering the device. Well, what does that mean? Well, think about all of the devices that you may choose to protect, whether they're in a substation, whether they're overhead, what's common among all of that? Well, they're all connected with a conductor, whatever that voltage rating is. But the line, the, the, the phase conductor is ubiquitous among all of this. So what Critter Guard thought of years ago is what if we block that access? What if we almost like, you know, if you're traveling down the highway and you see the detour signs and they're moving you over in the other lane and they're doing it a mile before the actual bridge that they're working on. It's a detour, it's a blockade. You can't go that way. You have to go a different route. And as such, you as the traveler in the car or truck can't even get to the side of the bridge that they're working on because they've diverted you. That's essentially what Critter Guard products do, is they divert the animal from even getting close. So we think of the conductor as a highway, as a means to get to wherever they want to go. Why do they want to go there is not really our concern. We just know they're curious. Usually it's for food, clothing, shelter kinds of things. Um, but basically it's like, how do we keep them out? Because if you place a guard over the device, you're not keeping anybody out. All you're doing is in, in encouraging the um, curious behavior. So they're going to come check out that guard and see if they can get to it or get into it or chew it or any other sorts of, you know, curiously destructive behavior. So the other analogy here is the power pole. Regardless of what it's constructed of, wood, steel, concrete, whatever, that conductor is a highway. And the animals from the ground, crawling animals, use that power pole as a highway to get to the top. For a transformer, maybe it's humming or buzzing or generating heat. And all of those are attractive to the curious critters. So that's really our approach is how do we stop that? Well, the number one product that we offer is a product called Line Guard. It's a very generic name, uh, but it's near universal for all overhead asset protection. We've got line guards installed across the country uh, for some of the biggest utilities and some of the smallest utilities and even commercial businesses or military installations that run their own substations. Um, and basically it doesn't matter what the voltage rating of the line is because it's not an insulator. It's literally a set of rollers on the line. So the name implies that it's guarding the line, but in fact, it guards the assets on the line. Key distinction there. The other key distinction is, is that this product moves. It doesn't just sit there and, uh, 
and cover a device, it sits there most of the time, 99% of the time. But on the rare occasion that an animal does make its way across a line or up a pole, the design is one that causes the animal to engage with the device and it moves. And as soon as it moves, it screws him up because now he doesn't know what he can do. He can't get his claws in it. He can't really get over it. Um, it makes him un unstable and blocks his progress. So it makes him go back the other way. It works on not just squ squirrels, but rats, mice, any kind of rodents, snakes, monkeys. We have a, a, in the last number of years, it's been quite entertaining. Um, we have international customers that work in mines um, and the underground miners have a tremendous um, uh, redundant network set up to make sure that they don't lose power in the mine. You can imagine being in some cases a mile underground or several miles back in a, in caverns and caves and and uh, and mines and what happens if the power goes out well it's not good well their answer in these situations is complete redundancy there's only one problem the only thing they haven't been able to make redundant is the overhead lines we put on um line guard and pole guard on their overhead network, miles and miles of networks um, so providing the mines. And their, their number one issue was the monkeys, small spider monkeys that would crawl up the poles and move down the lines and, of course, um, create havoc when they happened to touch in the wrong place and created a bridge. Um, so those are the kinds of problems that they couldn't figure out how to, how to deal with. Line guards stop that issue. So the monkeys can't get by it. Um, obviously, we're talking reasonably small monkeys. If this was a baboon, that's a different story. But those apparently don't go up that high. So I've got a video I want to show you. I didn't link it here just for the vagaries of running this. This will show you. It's about a minute and a half video. I'll go back and redo that. So this is a, a large rat or a rodent. Um, the tail is not as bushy as you'd expect for a squirrel. So that's why I think it's probably more of a rat. Um, but at any rate, you'll see a triplex overhead service insurance cable. This was a, um, a homeowner. We sell these to all kinds of businesses, but also homeowners as well. Uh, actually, that's how the product got started and designed years ago, uh, was to keep squirrels off uh, roofs and eaten through uh, wood shake shingles and things like that. Um, insurance companies do not pay for animal damage. And so as a result, this product got invented and has been improved and, and increased over the years with customer feedback um, as to how it works. And so that's what's made it so popular. Um, but the reality is you see this animal doesn't give up. They, they want to get where they want to go. And the line is the highway. And so he's been turned back once or twice and he's trying again. And he comes up to the wheel, which he can see through and it makes him think, okay, well, I can just go to the other side, but it turns on him and the weight, his own weight causes him to go upside down and hang on the line. And then if he gets really ambitious and decides to try to jump it, then you see the independent rollers. This is not one series of rollers. These are five independent rollers that all spin independently. And they're smooth uh, with the exception of the notches where they, they uh, snap together like a clamshell. Uh, but the reality is, is that the squirrel or animal can't get their claws in it. And as, a, as such, if they do try to jump, um, whether it's to the second, third, fourth, or fifth roller, they're going to slide right off. And that's generally the last time they try it. Once they slide down, it doesn't, doesn't hurt the animal. You've seen squirrels drop. Uh, doesn't hurt the animal. There's no damage to the line or anything else. They just decide, maybe I need to find a different path. So that's basically how, that's the concept of how it works. And the question is, well, then where can I use it? 
Okay, so so that's line guard. The good question is, well, where do I use it? Well, you can kind of see uh, almost anywhere. Um, the the number one choice throughout the country is sub feeder lines. Uh, pretty much any line that creates a pathway from the forest, the trees, the grass, the, the grassy knoll, wherever, that the animals can then get into the substation. We call it basically a virtual roof. Um, so the animals will find a way down the lines, come down into the substation, make a nest, have babies, whatever they're going to do. If these lines are covered with line guard, the animals can't get by it. And obviously, if you stop the small animals, then you've also stopped the food supply chain for birds and other animals that would fly in. And so if you can stop the small critters from making a nest in the sub, then you can also stop a lot of the overhead traffic as well. You can put it literally anywhere on the line that is convenient for you and your guys to, to get access to. Once you put it on, you're never going to take it off. It's not a product that requires maintenance um, or um, one that needs to be, um, you know, deinstalled to service what's behind it because you're not servicing the line generally. Uh, and, and therefore, it's not like a traditional cover or guard where you have to remove it to do thermography or other, um, you know, testing or maintenance on the underlying device. Line guard can be put up in either a de-energized state or on a hotline. Um, we we have both. Uh, the The largest majority of installations are de-energized, but we have a few customers that say we have no choice. We got to put it up hot, and so we have various clamps and hotline clamps where if you need to use a hot stick and and insulated gloves, that can be done as well. Supports a wide variety of lines and, and cable bundles. Uh, you just saw the triplex line there. Um, the normal opening is a one inch opening on the rollers, but they can be cut back in the field before installation to support up to three inch diameter cable bundles. Uh, so if you've got, you know, a, a triple aught or something type lines that are twisted in a triplex, it'll still support that sort of a service. Uh, regarding voltages, it's primarily a distribution-related uh, system, uh, but we have customers that have got them that we know of. Uh, we have a bunch of installations that we don't know exactly how they're doing it. They just never sent them back or complained, but we know some of the big utilities are using it on 77 kV lines. Um, no issues, and they have been for years. So um, pretty, uh, pretty. Uh, uh, universal type product. The other one is pole guard. Um, so line guard and then pole guard. And just like we talked about with the overhead lines being a highway, the pole is also a highway for critters to get from the ground up overhead. Pole guard blocks that highway. So it's the same concept. We use the same rollers that you just saw, but they're supported by two rigid plates that surround the pole. And that creates the blockade, the barrier for the animal as they go up the pole, as opposed to other wraps that you've probably seen or may use. Uh, we've physically seen animals jump those. If they get a head start going up a pole, they'll go right past it. Um, with pole guard, they can't. Um, so they basically get stopped by the plates and then again, it's the same kind of mechanism. They sort of trap them to, to hang on, it forces them to the outside where they're now upside down and trying to get past the spinning roller. There's an example of both line guard and pole guard. This is a water utility company. Uh, and you see they've even put line guard on the, uh, on the guy wires. They've got the normal guy guards on the wires but it didn't stop the animals. They kept going right to the top of the pole. So they put line guard on those lines as well, and then pole guard on the pole, and no issues since. We support 
different kinds of mounting mechanisms for pole guards. So rather than just wooden poles, we also have a different uh, structure underneath for the steel or concrete poles. And in really specialized situations like the picture on the right, you see the, the large riser. Um, and that was a trick because no one knew how to do that. So we came up with a slightly modified plate, an additional set of plates. And again, no animals up that pole since. So it's really been, um, you know, a, a great story. We also have done in, on few occasions, we can modify the plates on a customized basis for whatever profile of pole you have. Obviously, if you take too much of the material away from the plates, in other words, if it's too big of a pole, then there's not enough um, structure there to maintain a larger system. So there is a limit to how large we can go. That's why I make the comment 12 inch diameter is standard on a pole. But you can see that in the case of a concrete pole here, uh, that we can make those profiles and that work just fine as well. Then we also have a, we call it a gap filler, but it's just simply a flexible conduit that goes around the pole. So if you have a smaller diameter pole, because most poles will taper, uh, if it's a smaller diameter pole, the gap filler basically is an inch and a half diameter, and it'll fill that gap from the spacing between the pole and the plates. Okay, so that covers the biggest part of animal damage with squirrels and crawling animals, but what about birds? So birds are the number two issue, so how do you deal with that? Well, if any of any you have worked with bird issues, it's not like crawling animals. There's no quote unquote standard way to address birds because you could have raptors, the big, you know, maybe it's an osprey or an eagle or a hawk or an owl, which tend to be, you know, individual um, uh, and sometimes solo flyers, um, all the way up to small birds, which then fly in flocks and, and groups. Um, so, and the behavior is completely different. So we came up with a product that's basically not a mechanical diverter. So we're not diverting the bird. We're actually, um, well, we are, but we're not doing it the way you'd think. This stuff is scent based. It's easy to hang up. It lasts a long time. You won't like it. You don't want to keep it in your office or warehouse. As soon as you get it, you want to hang it up outside because it stinks. And birds, as it turns out, have a fairly highly developed sense of smell. Their nostrils, especially if you've ever seen a close-up of a hawk or an eagle and you look at their beak, they have actually fairly pronounced openings, nasal openings. And their um, brain sensors are directly tied to that. So they can smell things from quite a ways away. And so this scent will propagate an area like a substation and basically train the birds that as they fly in and go, I think I want to set up shop here and maybe make a nest. They'll basically say, no, I don't like it here. It's giving me a headache. The material doesn't hurt the birds. It's completely organic. Uh, actually, all the, all the ingredients are uh, on the uh, generally regarded as safe list from the EPA and the FDA. Um, so there's, there's nothing hazardous about the material at all. It's just an irritant. And so it works on just about every bird species that we've come into contact with. Uh, not all of them. We don't have experience with every bird, but every place we've hung it up, the customers come back and said, we haven't seen a bird since. And so it's really been a, a, a great mechanism. So it, I won't necessarily call it a force field. Don't think Star Wars here. Um, it's not necessarily a force field, but it does create a vapor area that the birds don't like. And as they come in and try to come back, because birds will always come back to where they're comfortable, where they know. And especially season after season, they will come back to where they had the nest last year. And this is where the analogy of, well, we'll just move the nest. Well, that sort of works, but unfortunately, if you move the nest, 
All it does is create opportunities for even more nesting. Dominion told us that some years ago when they put this up is they had spent thousands of dollars uh, building fake poles to put the nests on and relocate the birds. But that wasn't so effective because all they ended up doing was, was creating a, um, you know, uh, government housing, if you will, for new birds to come in and nest. So that wasn't a, a great strategy. The, um, the bird block material trains the birds not to come back. So once they get a scent, they're like, okay, I don't like this. We're going to go someplace else. And that's really all you want to accomplish is make them move. One of the advantages, it is a timed release. The material does have an odor that will fade over time. The trick in the material is making it last long enough so it trains the birds. And in our case, we've been able to do that up to about four months. So from the time you hang the product, and it's easy to hang, uh, from the time you hang the product to the time that, especially if you're hanging it where birds have been known to congregate, uh, in the next day or two, they're pretty much out of there. And then they don't come back, even when the scent has faded, because they recognize the, the bags. They recognize, hey, wait a minute, that's where I got the headache before. So that's that's been a successful situation. You can use bird block just about anywhere. Again, any place, they're, they're very small bags. They're about two ounces or 50 grams of material in each bag. Uh, bag. It's like a burlap bag. Um, and we tie them together. So it looks like a bolo tie. They're easy to hang around, um, you know, the structural members of a substation, uh, about every six to eight feet. Uh, depending on how many you put in one place, you can, you know, uh, put several uh, bags together and make a stronger scent to cover a broader area. But uh, basically all these areas that you see from cross arms to uh, like uh, overhead on bus bars, um, generator stations, uh, depots, warehouse, any kind of a high bay ceiling where your maintenance crew or, or distribution uh, group is servicing trucks and loading up trucks to make several rolls. The birds will fly into those areas and be way up top and crap all over everything. And nobody likes that. And this gets rid of that. So a couple of uh, examples here. The picture on the left is, is actually a, a 750,000 watt generator station uh, at a nuclear power station on the East Coast. Um, this was a, uh, you can see the, the concrete uh, bunker, if you will. Um, all of the, the structural members and the, the uh, gas-cooled phase conductors at the top, the birds would get in there, and these were large birds because they're close to the water, and so they're hunting, and we just hung the bags. You can see a close-up of the bag on the right-hand picture in a different substation. Literally just hung around a structural member. That's a live substation being put on hot, um, and, you know, we were like, well, can we shut it down? And, of course, the utility said, no, we don't want to do that because we thought about trying to get more coverage. And so we came up with the idea of hanging more of them in one place, and that worked out just great. Those structural members are eight feet apart, and we hung several in each bag, and it's been two years now, and they've still never seen another bird come back. So it's really been fantastic. So... To try to summarize, um, it's kind of short and sweet, but the old saying, if your grandmother ever told you this, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So rather than waiting for the next attack, because you know it's coming, rather than wait for it, why not block the highway? Why not um, you know, create a mechanism where the, the birds, the critters can't get past it? So it's much easier to deal with. You don't have to have a different size or a different rating for each device or for each asset that you're trying to protect. You simply block the line, block the pole, or protect the substation from birds. Once you put these products up, there is no reason to go back and service them. We've had 
Uh, Ameren in St. Louis is probably one of our longest serving customers. They use it throughout the St. Louis area. Uh, many others as well, Duke, AEP, the list goes on and on. Um, but basically, once you put these up, you never come back. Um, the only thing that goes wrong is if you don't install it correctly or if you don't follow our instructions for installation, which are quite easy, but don't cheat the installation. We've got videos online that show how to do it. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to put up a system. Uh, and once you put it up, you don't need to come back to that area to ever do it again. And so um, at any rate, that's, that's the system. Uh, very much appreciate your attention and your time. Thanks, Randy, for letting us do this. Uh, CritterGuard is available online, CritterGuard.org. Don't use CritterGuard.com. We don't own that domain. Uh, CritterGuard.org. Uh, we've been here a long time. Uh, we sell our products internationally all over the world. Um, our, usually most um, shipments are done within 24 to 48 hours of the order. Uh, all kinds of uh, options and configurations. Any questions at any time, by all means, send me an email or, or get on the website and send a form in, and we'll be happy to get back to you right away. With that, I'll give it back to Randy for questions. All right. Thanks very much, John, for a good presentation. We have uh, several questions, actually many questions. The first one being, does uh, do the rollers require maintenance to keep them rolling well? No, they don't. Um, the, um, they're designed in a way that uh, will handle snow, ice, rain, wind, all sorts of elements. Uh, there are weep holes in the, in the rollers so that as moisture or condensation will settle on the inside of the roller, it'll also drain back out. Um, basically what we tell people when you install the rollers Number one requirement is make sure that each roller that you put up spins freely and independently, literally with the flick of a finger. Mm -hmm. So the way that might not work is if you happen to have a cable bundle like a triplex or something that's too large for the opening of the roller. And as I mentioned, there's a way to cut those rollers back ahead of time to go up to about a three inch cable bundle. That doesn't affect um, the reliability or the effectiveness of the system. And again, once you put it up, as long as the system doesn't slide apart, if you go back to think about the video, generally the first roller is all that's required to scare an animal away. But there are some, like in the video, that get a little too ambitious and they want to jump it and go on. That's why each roller has to spin independently because if it's sitting there for years and it's had freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing, you want that roller to spin when the animal jumps on it. And the only way the system's gonna fail is if it doesn't spin. So if you've got plenty of slack when you put the rollers on, you're gonna get along just fine. Okay, you mentioned icing. The next question is any issues with, the, with line loading with respect to icing on the lines and how does line guard work with icing events? Yeah, so um, um, long story short, uh, we've sold these in Canada to the Canadian National Defense Network for about 12 years. They continue to put it throughout their substations. Well, certainly there's a lot of snow and cold and ice up there. So it works just fine. The way it works is exactly what, what we said. There is always a droop on a line that droop is designed by the utility to make sure that ice loading doesn't stay there very long so that when there is a thaw, it all runs downhill, so to speak. So if it's frozen, obviously the rollers are not going to spin. And unfortunately, I don't know. I don't know that anybody measures or tracks what uh, animal traffic is when lines are iced up. Um, but I think if those lines are running 200 degrees based on the current in the line, it's not going to stay iced up very long. And so what happens is it melts. If it does run into the rollers, which is perfectly fine, it'll drip out of the rollers because of the weep holes that are there. Um, and so we've not had an issue with that. 
Um, in, okay. in addition, we've had uh, independent third-party testing by a professional engineering firm that basically simulated hurricane-style winds uh, at up to 75 miles an hour sustained continuous wind to induce continuous spinning to see if there was any chance of, uh, you know, failed retention on the line and the system passed with flying colors. Okay. What solution, oh, here, here's another question. Have any animals overcome the rollers yet, needing to add more rollers or different features? Well, we have, uh, we're not expert on every animal. We have uh, Australian, New Zealand customers that have their version of a squirrel. Um, I actually don't even remember now what they call it. It's slightly larger than what our squirrels are in North America. Um, and when they first started using it 12 years ago, uh, they had one utility, I believe this was Osgrid in, in Australia, that complained that the squirrels were getting by it. So our distributor there went to investigate and find out what was going on. And what they found out is, is that two things. Uh, number one, when the utility put it on, they tried to be cost effective. So they got shipped five rollers and two wheels, but they only put up two rollers. And the squirrel jumped it, their version of a squirrel, which I said is slightly larger than ours. It jumped it and kept around going, and they watched it happen. So then they put on the third wheel, third roller. It jumped that. By the time they got all five on, the squirrel had learned to jump all five rollers. And so they said, this system doesn't work. And our distributor said, well, could we just encourage you to go put another system up on another line, but put all five up the way we suggested it? They did. The squirrel couldn't get by it. So don't train the squirrels. Okay. Is, the answer. is line guard installed above the Johnny ball? I'm sorry. That's a term I don't know. I don't know that term either. Okay, let's uh, let's go to the next question. Do you have a uh, – yeah, they have videos on how pole guard works – uh, and approximate area coverage per bag? Um, it's about four to six feet square foot. So um, four to six square feet. So if you hung a single bag up, um, it, you could draw a circle around, you know, four to, four to six feet diameter around the center of that bag. Um, so I, I mentioned one of the ways to uh, overcome that and is to put, let's say, for instance, it's just not convenient or uh -huh. able to hang more bags in a higher density than that. One way to do that is to hang two or three bags in one location, and now you'll get a radius of six to eight feet. And so if you had then your next set of bags eight feet away, you've got some overlap of scent, and again, what you're trying to do is train the birds. So they get trained quite quickly in the first day or two. What we have a, a, a whole instructional profile on installing bird block, but the first thing you have to do is make sure there's no nests. The nests have to be removed and you probably need to wash down an area because if there's bird scat or guano, whatever in the area that attracts them, they come back, they know it's safe. So that has to be washed down first, then you hang up bird block, and then the birds will come back because they recognize the area, but then they'll leave quite quickly, and then they won't come back. Okay. Does the scent work for rodents or other critters? Unfortunately, no. Uh, for whatever reason, um, the scent is specific to avian species. We've tried it with animals, and it doesn't seem to have any effect. So... There's something about how the animals are developed that it's a completely different system. Okay. Does the line guard snap over the conductor or yes. does the conductor need to be threaded through it? No, it snaps over the conductor okay. like a clamshell. So the installation is you put the clamshells together in the bucket truck or on the ground first so they look like clams and then you snap them over the line. And once they're snapped together, the design is such that they will not come apart. 
So you need to be quite sure um, that it's going to spin freely before you snap it over the line. Because once it snaps, you can put it over it and test it. But once you snap it together, it can be taken apart, but the system will be unusable if you take it apart. Um, is, okay, is, an, is anti-animal electronic high frequency noise effective in driving animals away? Uh, beyond the scope of this presentation. We've not tried that. I know people have used um, various kinds of um, noisemakers, um, electronic interference, uh, lasers for birds. All of these systems have some degree of, of success depending on who you talk to. They're incredibly expensive, hard to maintain, and require um, definitive technical assistance just to be able to make it work. Um, Kierkegaard is no such requirements. Quite simple to, to install and use. Right. Do you have pole guard for square poles? What is protection mechanical NEMA 4X IP66? Yeah, um, we can support square poles as I showed that profile earlier. Um, obviously that's a custom engineered thing because there is a maximum to that size of square. Uh, and for that matter, a minimum, we had a request to do like a four inch square steel pole in a substation, we can't get that small, uh, at least not cost effectively. Okay. Um, so right. it can be done uh, relating to the standards. Um, yeah, all of this is, is um, it, this material is made of the same material that we make brake linings for cars. It's super hard plastic, UV rated, will last for 30 years. And yes, it has a host of, of uh, ASTM, and NEMA standards behind it. Okay. I assume there is no bearing on the roller. Can the roller cause wear on the cable or insulation due to friction? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely uh, there is no bearing. So it spins freely. It's simply a empty roller with the conductor running through it longitudinally. Um, so that's why I mentioned when you install it, you've got to just spin it with your finger and make sure that you've got it spinning freely. With respect to wear, um, the practical answer is no. Um, the real answer is, is that, again, we had this simulated with induced continuous spinning. And the answer was it would take 62 years <laughs> of continuous spinning for the roller to create a score on a standard MCM uh, conductor cable. Uh, and that score was so small as to be almost unnoticeable. So the reality is weather doesn't happen that way. It's very difficult for wind um, to make the roller spin because the wind has to be at a precise angle and it has to be continuous at that angle. And it hardly ever is. Yeah. So it may spin one way, then spin back the other, and then sit there in a windstorm. Uh, we've had uh, Entergy as an anecdotal example in the Gulf Coast, no stranger to hurricanes and hurricane damage. They've gone back out to recover their lines from poles that have been knocked over. And they told me, they said, John, you can't believe it. Line Guard helps us locate flooded lines because your buoys float in the water. <laughs> so they were able to see the floating buoys installed in their lines and go, hey, we got lines down there in the flood. We need to get those out. So, so uh, but yeah, there's it. Um, they'll last um, through lots of extreme weather. Okay. And uh, Raymond uh, wanted everyone to know that Johnny balls are the insulated balls used to tie guy wires from the, ah. pole, from the pole and the spike in the ground together. The two guy wires are electrically insulated from each other. So. Okay, so no, the uh, line guard would not be designed to go over those balls. Um, it's designed to go over the line, the guy wire. We have customers using line guard. On, it doesn't have to be an energized line. Um, it could be any sort of a mechanical or structural cable. Um, and again, you see in the case of the pole guard guy wires, 
that they're used over and above the standard guy guards. And we've made this point several times that the issue with a guy guard, as good as it is and as ubiquitous as it is, it's an eight foot long split loom product that if you have any kind of a deviation or slope or um, um, what's the right word, um, a droop on that line, the guy guard won't spin uh, because it's, it's, it's not a straight line. And so they really only work on perfectly straight lines. Mm -hmm. And even then, when there's an angle like a, a guy wire, an animal can still go right by it. So when you put the line guard up, because it spins when they engage it, and because there's five of them, it's like that old game show, uh, American Ninja Warrior, where the spinning barrels, one barrel goes one way and another one goes the other way. They can't, they can't keep their footing when they go across line guard. Right. Okay, thanks very much, John, for the excellent presentation. Thank you, thanks. everybody, for your attention. Thank you. Okay.